Good evening. Do you ever feel like you're not getting your advertising right and you're attracting the wrong kind of tenants? Or are you feeling completely lost because you don't even know where or how to advertise? If so, fear not, you are in absolutely the right place because tonight we're going to be talking to expert David Isaacoff from Rentboard who's going to be giving you the inside scoop on how to advertise your properties, where to advertise for properties so that you can attract quality tenants. Welcome, David, to Alberta Landlords Watch, formerly known as Ask Nelda Schulte. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great, great that you're here. And uh, welcome, Gil, again. Hello. Gil joins us from Vancouver. David is now in Vaughan, Ontario but not permanently, he's just visiting. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, Alberta Landlords Watch is formerly known as Ask Nelda, because predictably, because it's it's the same as my business name, and my name predictably is Nelda Schulte, and uh, as mentioned, I'm joined tonight by Gil Donkersgood, who's my former partner in, um, when I had a property management business, Calgary Dwelling Consultants, and Gil is joining us from BC, and I'm also joined by special guest David Isaacoff from Rentboard, who is from Ontario and Toronto, Ontario. So David started his career in real estate, working as a development consultant, helping developers get purpose-built rental projects from pre-development through to stabilization. And then after a while, he thought, hey, I'm collecting all this great data. Why don't I segue this into another career? And so he took his data knowledge and he applied it to Canada's largest multifamily marketing firm, where he specializes in data analy analy analytics help. <laughs> <laughs> to help clients make more informed decisions. So um, thank you, David, for joining us again. And um, let's just jump right in. So you're going to give us the inside scoop on how to advertise your properties to attract quality tenants. So where should landlords advertise? Let's start. Well, with <clears throat> yeah, great question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I know a lot of landlords, you know, they tend to kind of stick with what works. But uh, we have to acknowledge that nowadays, 75%, if not more, of all leasing activity happens online. So first and foremost, make sure that you're, you know, you're actually targeting where renters are. Uh, so make sure that you're putting your properties out there online. You know, Rentboard, RentFaster, Rentals.ca, those are all fantastic avenues. Uh, certainly in Alberta, RentFaster, Rentboard uh, have really, really strong, you know, renter uptake and have, uh, you know, pretty strong, you know, activity amongst renters on a daily basis. Yeah, and that's really important. So depending on what region you're in, people will, well, tenants will migrate more towards certain sites. And uh, I like to use this as an example. When I first bought a property in Fort McMurray, when I, where I started advertising was where everybody looked, which was in the local newspaper. I know, yes, newspapers seem very archaic. And it was Wednesday night's newspaper. So you had to make sure your ad got in on a Wednesday night. And that's when people would start calling you. And then it changed. Then it moved on to Kijiji. And then from Kijiji, it moved on to Rent Faster and Rent Board. And now it's Rent Board, Rent Faster and Marketplace. Facebook seems to have also taken up a big share of the real estate here on the, on the online rental platforms. So yes, depending on your area, um, the thing I really like about Rent Board and Rent Faster is that they're national. So you can advertise in the comfort of your own home and it can go national because you never know where people are coming from when they're looking for a rental property. They're not just in your city. Sometimes people are moving into provincially or globally. And so you have to hit a rental market that everybody can access. And that's very popular as rent board is. So next question is, what are the components of a good ad and why? And I know that's a loaded question. Yeah, that is, uh, I, I could probably talk about this for a good 15, 20 minutes, but um... I, I like to say that you know a, a good um, a good listing ultimately attracts really good um, really good tenants because you know ultimately they really go hand in hand they're one and the same um, you know when you're putting together uh, you know a complete listing ultimately you know there there are basically ten rules that I like to you know consider uh, <clears throat> which ultimately ensure that you're giving the tenant exactly what they need you're putting it together in a really nice cohesive you know high quality format. And ultimately, you're not throwing out, you know, um, any unnecessary file word content. So, you know, keeping it simple, nice short description about the property. Um, avoid using one standard unit. You know, we, we see this quite a lot with smaller landlords uh, or smaller properties. If you only have, let's say, two, you know, one beds or two, two beds, um, instead of creating individual, uh, you know, units within each listing for each uh, unit availability, 
you only create one. No, nope. typically we recommend create individual availability for each available unit. Uh, it typically shows better. And if there are variations, you know, if someone says, well, I want a quarter unit or I don't, I want a first or second floor unit, it gives them that information and ensures that they're actually pre-qualified before they reach out. Mm -hmm. um, from there, really high quality photos. Nowadays, you know, thank God all of us have fantastic smartphones. You know, you can take really high quality shots on your phone. Make sure you do that. Don't take cluttered shots. Make sure they're not blurry. And if they are, retake them. There's, you know, there's nothing worse for you than a blurry image on an online listing. Um, and then, you know, just make sure the listings are complete, right? That's really important. And again, I see big and small landlords. They fail at this on a daily basis. You know, if you have amenities, unit features, put that in the listing. Because if you fill out your listings correctly, the listings are then searchable. So if a, if a, if a you know tenant wanted to you know were to go on rent fast or rent forward, and they said, well, I'm only interested in units between this price, and I'm only interested in units with a dishwasher and uh, you know let's say tile floors because my cat has, you know tends to pee outside the litter box. Well, if you enter those correctly, your unit will show up properly. Whereas if you don't, it's not going to show up, and your visibility gets reduced. Um, and then you know from there, a few basic you know kind of uh, housekeeping practices uh, or housekeeping rules. Excuse me. Descriptions: 500 words or less. We're not writing or diatribes here. Um, you know, you want to start with your best features, mention the neighborhood, and then the biggest one, avoid all caps. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, it doesn't read well, and it also throws off alarms for a lot of people. You know, when you look at a listing, you want it to look professional, you want it to look put together. And the moment you start seeing all caps, you start thinking one of two things. Either this is a scam, or I need to stay away because this person, <laughs> you know, if, if the listing is a mess, I don't even know what they're going to be like as my landlord. Yeah. Yeah. So you're making a first impression with the way you write and the way you present your ad, not just your apartment, house, or condo itself. Absolutely. Do you want to show us uh, examples of good rental properties? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me share my screen here for you. Um, your screen share on the bottom of my screen. I don't know if it's it's in the middle. It's the little square with the arrow that goes up. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so I just need to give you permission. And here we are. Young and Eglinton. I used to live close by the way. <laughs> so this is, you know, just a basic example of a really high quality listing. Of course, this is a larger property. Um, <clears throat> There we go. Um, ultimately, really what you're looking for here is you're looking to make sure that everything's complete. You know, we have a nice profile photo. It's high quality. All the information is complete. We see here that the property is pet friendly. They have multiple units listed. And most and very, very importantly, each of the units has a square footage. When we scroll down here, just like I said, so we see here there are individual units. Each unit has an individual rent. One thing that, uh, you know, is, is a misconception that is becoming increasingly less so uh, you know, landlords used to not include rent in a listing. They said, well, if, if they're interested, they, they're going to call me. That doesn't happen. That's if crazy. They don't see your, if they don't see your rent, they're just going to move on to the next property. Well, yeah, because when you think about it, whenever you're going to buy anything or rent anything, you want to know what the price is. Well, firstly, you want to know where it is, because is it close to work? Is it close to my, you know, school, whatever it is that you, you need it to be close to? And then secondly, can I afford it? Absolutely, and, yeah. If you don't list the price, how are you going to know if you can afford it? And yeah. and uh, they're probably going to search based on price as well. So if you don't have the price, you're not going to show up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we've done some analysis recently on uh, what renters are actually searching for when they're looking for units. So um, first and foremost, price is the biggest. You know, is the biggest factor. Um, it's not the biggest factor for every age group, though. If you're dealing primarily with households aged uh, 55 plus. Uh, price is going to be the main consideration. If you're dealing with households aged 18 to 23, or 24, excuse me, it's also the biggest consideration. Anywhere in between there, at that point, they're more focused on lifestyle, amenities, and finishes or features. Uh, but ultimately, price and the unit, that's what everybody's looking for, and they have to make sure it's within their you know, lifestyle requirement and price point. Mm, okay. um, and then last but not least, here we have a nice description. This one I will say is a little bit long, but ultimately what it does is it gives us a short little blurb, uh, talks about the property, talks about the communities, and then talks about the unit. And that's what we want to focus on. Yeah, I looked through this actually when you sent me the links and I thought, holy caboodles, is this ever long? Do you want to scroll down and show them how long this is? <laughs> uh, this is just a screenshot, so I don't quite have it, but let's just say it's twice as long as this. Yeah. Uh, typically. 
about a thousand amenities, including <laughs> the washer, dryer, carburetor. Like it listed every thing. So the list was as long as my arm. So yeah, I mean, but it told you exactly what was included in the, in the apartment. And I thought, oh, maybe I should pack my bags and go. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> Uh, here I have another example of a property from Red Board. Uh, so here again, we see they have the individual unit breakdowns, bed, bath, square footage, again, very important. They have the utilities. Uh, again, very, very important. If utilities are included, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not including it within the listing. And then last but not least here, we see here a very short description. It talks about the unit. It talks about the, bed, the, the, the unit type. It gives you a description of what's included within the unit. And then it gives you a short blurb about the neighborhood about what you're getting, about transportation, and you know some of the local amenities. Brilliant, that's brilliant. So yeah, just to reiterate, and that's something I always learn something new from every single person we ever we we interviewed, and I I d wasn't aware that there were certain demographics where money wasn't really an issue. You know, I always thought everybody went by price and by neighborhood, but clearly it's not everybody. It's it's eighteen to twenty three looks for price yeah. 55 onward looks for price and then there's that middle group that want a beautiful place in a great area and you know offers all the great stuff that they want a yoga studio whatever dog wash <laughs> yeah yeah that's becoming increasingly more common certainly as you know real estate costs or prices go up in a lot of you know major markets people are being priced out of you know purchasing a home so they're they're being relegated to the rental market for longer and as you know, they, their incomes continue to go up, so does the cost of buying a home. So ultimately, instead of buying a home, they, you know, now that they have stronger purchasing power, they want that increased quality of living. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a property that we rented in the Southeast, uh, just a really amazing place. And talk about amazing amenities. Uh, well, there are two that come to mind. One had a craft room, a car wash bay area, which is, is not at all uncommon. Um, it had a, a mechanic room where you could actually work on cars or something like the engines or whatever. It had a, a beautiful building in the center of the square that had the upstairs was a 360 floor to ceiling windows workout area. And downstairs, it had two conference rooms and about four offices that you could rent, which were fabulous now at fireplaces. It was amazing. And we saw another one that we, we were we rented as well. It had a concert hall and a, a, ki a kitchen, an industrial kitchen. I mean, those are two things I would have never thought of putting in a condominium building, but they were there, obviously, a concert hall. <laughs> it's like, how many concert pianists do you have with a concert hall? It's an absolute must in the next condo that I move into. But like, clearly, they thought that it would be a good selling feature for their potential tenants. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, I remember tennis courts and party rooms and, all, and pools. The one place had a pool. There's all sorts of really cool features that a person would look for. Yes. Yeah. Just uh, amazing stuff. It kind of makes you think, gee, I, my house is kind of cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a tennis court or a pool or a concert hall. I should, I should build a concert hall and attach my house onto it. All right. So what's a bad ad then, David? Yeah. Uh, I mean, ultimately a bad ad is one that either doesn't attract a, tent or a prospect or <laughs> makes you look like a scam. Uh, a bad ad is one, you know, with blurry images. It's one with a lack of images. We thought we typically recommend, uh, you know, if you're going to put together an ad, you want to include at least one exterior shot. Show them what the property looks like, uh, and then you want to include at least, at least, and that I say at least as a rule of thumb, at least eight interior shots. You want to make sure you're giving them a few of the common areas, one of the bedroom, uh, and then maybe from a few different perspectives as well. You know, it gives them a better, it gives prospects a better understanding of what they're really looking into. Um, another example of a bad listing is one where just there's no information. You know, you can give me a description, but if none of the other fields are complete, the, the, the listing on its own doesn't look very good. And if it doesn't look very good, it's not going to appeal to renters. And if it doesn't appeal to renters, they're not going to leave, you know, they're not going to submit any leads. Uh, and then last but not least from there, it's really going to be a ad that just feels, you know, it, it feels discombobulated. Uh, sometimes we'll have listings that have very specific instructions. You know, you must do this. You have to do this. Avoid that at all costs. You're not there to give them a list of instructions or demands. You're there just to tell them about the property. You know, your job is to sell the property. Their job is to sell themselves. So make sure that you're doing a good job selling the property. You're not, you know, they're not your tenant yet. Yeah, I like to see those ads where they say, know this, know that, know this, know the... <laughs> <laughs> It's like a, the Ten Commandments backwards. <laughs> I don't 
don't know. Kind of a strange thing. There was a, a property. I used to live in this area in, in Edmonton, downtown Edmonton, and there was a property that was right on the corner that I had to cross by every time I walked out. And there was an ad on the window that the owners had put on, and they said, no drinking, no drugs, no, you know, they had a whole list of no's. And on the bottom, they said, no evil. That's going to attract a lot of tenants. <laughs> there, was, there was that Airbnb in Sedona where they had, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was just, everything had rules, including the shower you were allowed to have. They had a timer on the shower so that you couldn't take a shower longer than a certain amount of time. It had a little hourglass. They had little instructions there that said, you know, when this hourglass tips over, your shower should be finished. And we're just thinking this feels more like a sentence than a vacation. <laughs> Which is the review they go left them. <laughs> said, I thought we were taking a vacation. I didn't think we were getting a prison sentence. <laughs> so, yeah. I get what you're saying. It, it comes across, you don't want to come across being too um, authoritarian when you're trying to sell the property. No. You're, you, yeah. <laughs> yes, you have rules. I mean, everybody has rules. And of course, they need, you need to find out if they're going to honor your rules. And if you want to know how to do that, watch the last video with Hart Togman. He had some excellent, excellent ways to screen people to find out if they're the kinds of people who actually follow rules or not. And, um, but yeah, with while you're in the attraction phase, you're putting your best face forward. So you want to attract, not detract. So love, love your comments, David. And now it's Gil's turn. All right. So um, we answered the first question. So do you have some tips on setting competitive rental rates? Yes, absolutely. Um, so. You know, what I like to say is setting rents is, uh, you know, equal parts art, science, and a little bit of intuition as well. Um, it's something that you have to, you know, just you you learn and you refine over time. You know, you're not going to set the rents right the first time, but uh, it comes with practice. And at the end of the day, it just comes time to educating yourself, right? Uh, you know, when we set rents, um, you know, there, again, I, I like to come up with rules. So there are three rules that I like to consider when I'm setting rents. Uh, the first is know your comps. You have to know who your competitors are. You have to know where they are. You have to know what they're offering. And then ultimately, you have to know what their prices are. From there, and equally important, know your know how you compare to your comps. The only way you can identify who your comps are, and when I say comps, I'm, I mean competitors, comparable properties. Uh, the only way to identify who they are is to understand what your property offers, the, the value proposition that your value you know, can offer renters, uh, so you have to understand the location, the age, the quality, you know, the level of fin features and finishes, you know, what level of luxury are you offering and does it compare to these other competitors? And then last but not least, it's just tracking the market. You have to do this on an ongoing basis. This isn't a one and done thing. This is a, this is something you do every every single week, every single month for the rest of your life. You know, I've spoken to uh, developers, you know, who are well into their 80s. And, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to a developer two years ago who was uh, joking about how you know, back in my day, we used to mystery shop every week. And he's like, you, you youngins probably don't even know what that's like. No, we still do that. We have to do that constantly. You know, every time I get a new project, I have to go to the, that building and I have to walk the building. And then I have to find out who the local competitors are and I have to walk their buildings. You know, I reach out to them. I, you know, I tell them that I'm a renter. I'm a, I want to find an apartment and I'll ask them to show me around and they'll do it. Uh, and that's how you get a sense of, you know, who your competitors are. And then from there, it's, it's really just an understanding of, you know, kind of rough a relative understanding of how you rank relative to your competitors. So um, I've prepared a couple of slides. We'll go through them very quickly. <clears throat> you know, I used to do this years ago. I worked um, as an employment specialist for a, a, college, a private college, and I used to go around and mystery shop. So I pretend that I was a potential student who wanted to take one of the programs, and I would book appointments with, with our competitors, and I'd see how they did. What my first impression was, was it professional? You know, what were their prices? What were they offering? What was my final impression when I left? Was it someplace that I was sold on or did I think, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we compared them all the time. We always used to mystery shop. So that's something you do in a lot of industries. Absolutely, like, yeah. Should definitely, you have to do. definitely do when I'm running ads, whenever I'm gonna run an ad, even, bef even when tenants, before they've given me their notice, I start shopping other ads and say, okay, what are other ads in the area renting for? What are other properties? Are they similar? Are they are they different? How different are they? What do they offer that I don't, and vice versa? And then then you know how to price your property. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, what I, you know, when I, whenever I go through this, you know, if we're uh, pricing units for a large development, you know, first and foremost, we have to understand what our unit mix is. So, you know, here we have, let's say, our recommended unit mix. You know, our, stu our studios are 450 to 500, one beds 550, and on and on and on. Now that we know what our building looks like and the types of units, you know, we should also understand what our, you know, amenities look like. We can start to go out and actually identify where comps are. So, first and foremost, you know, we, we've already been over this, but some of the factors to consider. And what we have to do is effectively you create a matrix, okay, of all of these various fields, and then you have to identify whether your property is superior, inferior, or the same. So location, you know, is your location superior, inferior, or the same? Is, you know, your property directly in front of a transit station or a subway stop? Uh, do you have better, uh, you know, services? Is it right next to a major employment hub, right? Um, or it doesn't have really good highway access. Again, accessibility, transit, walkability, drivability, Visibility, does the, does the building have really good visibility from street level? Um, does it have great views potentially? Uh, amenities, that is probably one of the biggest ones because amenities, you know, they, they help sell a building time and time again throughout the lifetime. Obviously this doesn't, um, you know, this isn't as relevant for smaller single family homes or duplexes, triplexes, but uh, this also includes some of the features and finishes. You know, um, do you offer, do you have a nicer oven potentially? Do you have cleaner floors? You know, um, how well is the property maintained? All of that goes into rent setting. <clears throat> okay. And then from there, it's basically just looking at the properties, understanding what their rents are. So actually collecting their rents. You know, back in the day, we used to, uh, we would have to call properties and we would have to call them over and over again. What are the one beds? What are the two beds? What are the three beds? Now we can find a lot of this stuff online, which is fantastic. There are also quite a few services that allow, uh, that provide you with comp data. Okay. Uh, and then from there, what we do is we basically write down everything, okay? You know, everything has to be either digital or on paper, you know, so I can compare it side by side, apples to apples, you know, oranges to oranges, you know? So this is an example of something that I'd done for a previous project, basically just recorded all the individual rents, uh, the unit types, the sizes, the mix, and the, uh, the actual rents, the ranges, excuse me, along with the finishes and the amenities, right? I call this my little cheat sheet and it tells me exactly what each property offers, okay? And then from there, once we finished ranking them, we understand, okay, if I have, let's say I'm looking at five different comps, I know how they all rank relative to my property. From there, I can then understand where my property should be on rents based on the rents that these other properties are achieving. You know, we say market rent. Well, market rent is just what the market is achieving. And that basically simply means whatever everyone else is charging. And that's how you set your rents. You set your rents based on what other people are charging. Holy caboodles. You know, a thousand square feet, not even nine hundred and sixty-four feet rents between twenty-four twenty and four thousand dollars. Yes, uh, I, I will say these rents are from the city of Toronto. <laughs> oh my God! Between a thousand and one thousand two hundred square feet, four thousand one hundred and five dollars. It's not as bad if you have roommates. <laughs> yeah, but you. For a thousand feet, that doesn't give you a lot of lot of space for. A it room. certainly doesn't. <laughs> but that's the reality we have to live with. Uh, yeah. You know, one beds for new construction in the city of Toronto. You know, this thing nowadays, uh, this this rent was taken about nine months ago. Now, a one bed will reasonably start between twenty two and twenty three hundred dollars. Um, a two bed starts at uh, the uh, a two bed size that you know a normal sized one bed size. You know, about six hundred and sixty six seventy square feet easily starts at $2,400 wow. and a three bed, you're not going to find anything under three grand. Wow. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, by all means, let me know. Otherwise, uh, you know, this is effectively the process of rent setting, you know, as you, you know, refine it in time and, you know, over and over again, you can, in, you can better understand what your property can achieve. You know, um, to what we typically will do is we, you know, we like, we start with round numbers. And then as, you know, we lease more and more units, we, you know, we push the rents higher and higher and higher. And as soon as we start slowing down the rate of leasing, we can kind of start to understand, okay, you know, we've hit the limit. This is the property isn't able to bear this or renters aren't able to bear this. And we bring the rents down. Yeah, okay. we'll, so we start at nice round numbers and then we go up $5 to $15 in, you know, in, in increments. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. So Gil? Everyone, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, do, how else can, uh, can can landlords add get noticed? What other tricks do you have? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know what? Uh, let me. Uh, so, one one of the things that uh, Rent Board and Rent Faster uh, both offer 
are um, we, we offer additional uh, you know uh, listing services or listing features, excuse me, uh, that are specifically targeted or meant for to allow uh, you know landlords, property owners to get um, you know, better exposure. So uh, Rentboard, uh, this would have been about six months ago, re uh, released featured listings. Uh, this allows you to pay for a basically a higher you know position within the rankings of all you know your local competitors when a prospect is looking for an apartment. Uh, what we found is that at the bare minimum, we have different ranks, obviously, it'll increase overall lead gen by two times. Uh, there is a higher tier of promoted listing that will actually increase lead gen by four times, which is fantastic because at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. If, you have, if you're having, you know, if you're struggling, you know, to fill a vacancy, uh, what you need to do is at a certain point, it becomes a number game, numbers game, excuse me, you know, because all it really takes is that one prospect to sign a lease. And once they've signed it, you know, you've made your money back. Yeah, they used to have a similar feature in Kijiji, but you get, depending on how many people were also vying for that top position, you could get bumped down to the bottom on page 10. So I never thought it was very good. <laughs> so yeah, I remember calling them and saying, how come my ads down at the bottom? I a feature ad and they're like, oh, well, you know, we had a hundred other people who also wanted a feature ad today. So you got bumped to the page 10. I thought, well, that's not really a feature ad now, is it? So but for it, you pay for a feature ad and your feature ad is right up at the top. That's where it sticks. This Correct. Yeah. That's one thing we were very adamant about. You know, uh, if someone pays for a featured ad, it has to appear ultimately. You know, um, if some, if you pay for a featured ad for one bed and someone is searching for a three bed, it's not as valuable. But if they're searching for that same type of unit, your listing is always going to appear right there at the top, you know, with really good visibility. The listings are twice the size of the other ones. Uh, it really draws the eye. <laughs> That's fantastic. That makes sense because once you're on page 10, you're probably not going to get seen anymore. No. <laughs> yeah. People don't have uh, a page for that, sorry. All right. So here's a fun one. I like this one. Rental scams are always coming up, usually seasonally. Can you tell us what types of scams you're seeing the landlords need to be aware of? Yeah. Uh, so it's funny, me and Nelda were just talking about this. Rental scams really are a seasonal thing. You know, we have a joke around the office that, uh, you know, the scammers like to take the holidays off. But that's that's really not they're that's not what they're doing. Uh, you know, they're they're just they like to prey on people. You know, they want to prey on people when you know they're at the the weakest, and the weakest is really when there's the most competition. You know, peak of summer, right? When the lease when leasing activity or rental activity is at its highest, that's when they're the busiest because they know that it's it's something that they can just kind of blend in with, right? Uh, so recently we've been seeing two very um, two types of um, you know of scams. I like to call them relistings and upfront payments. Um, uh, they're they're very similar all however they're uh they, they kind of go in opposite directions so the first one um and that's this is becoming more common certainly in larger communities you know toronto calgary vancouver victoria you know uh, we're seeing that across the country uh we'll see tenants relisting units um at a higher rent uh not as important certainly not you know not a huge scam not something to be you know overly concerned about but ultimately this is someone taking advantage of a landlord and nobody's happy to see it so what they do is they effectively will sublet the unit at a higher rate without letting the landlord know that it's happening. And we're seeing this at substantially higher rates recently. Um, and then the much bigger one, the one that's a you know, pretty big concern, we've, you know, I'm sure everybody's already read um, articles about this, certainly on you know, CBC, are you know, people that are claiming to be the homeowner. Mm -hmm. That one is huge. That one, unfortunately, well, maybe not huge, but it's, it's, it's growing. Um, it peaked about, I, I would say, last summer. Hopefully, we don't see a resurgence of it, but unfortunately, we likely will. Um, and, you know, oftentimes what this is is someone who, you know, they'll claim to own the property. They'll claim to be, you know, the representative of the property. Um, they'll have limited documentation. They'll ask for upfront payment. That's always a very big one. That's one thing we should always avoid. Um, and they'll attempt to rush the signing. You know, I like to say, um, you know, never let anyone pressure you into signing anything. Yeah. Certainly not when it involves parting with your own money. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, when it comes to when it comes to housing, people are desperate, you know, and they can be easily swayed sometimes. Um, these are two pretty big ones that we've been seeing recently. Uh, but there are a few other more general ones or things that people, you know, we typically say to look out for. Um, you know, like price is always a big one. You know, oftentimes, you know, they'll, what they'll do is they'll just have a very low price, you know, and that'll attract tons of people because you know the moment they see that price, their eyes glow and they think, oh my god. You know, this is too good to miss to, to pass up. I have to get this apartment. Little do they know that this person is basically, you know, it's a numbers game. They're looking for 200, 300 inquiries. And as long as, you know, one, maybe two people fall for the scam, 
they've already made thousands of dollars and they're happy. We used to see that a lot. Actually, when we ran a lot of ads with the property management business, our ads got hacked a number of times. So somebody yeah. said exactly what you're saying. Someone would take our ad, advertise it somewhere else for a lower price. So how we found out, A, we got calls from the police. B, we got calls from tenants who were looking for ads. And they said, did you know your ad's being advertised in two different places? One at this price and the other one at that price. We thought the low price was crazy. So, you know, we're going to call you and tell you about this. So tenants would help us, potential tenants to alert us. So that used to happen really very frequently, especially in the springtime. And then Gil wrote a, he actually wrote an article about another one that used to come up in the summer all the time. He called it, the, the article was called The Indomitable Ann Grove. Gil, do you want to tell us about Ann? Because this one comes up fairly frequently. I'm trying to remember. I, I believe Ann was... Oh, can you? I'm going to get you she to lives, help me on that. She lives uh, overseas, but overseas, she's not remote, that. or someplace where she can't communicate with people, and she wants to. She wants to rent your property sight unseen, and she has all this money because she got this inheritance, or you know, they, they're trying to convince you all the money they have, and she wants to, to to move in, and she wants to pay cash, or send you a money order. Um, but the scam is. Do you remember the scam, Bill? Uh, I believe the scam, this is the one because there's so many of them. I believe the scam is that uh, she uh, she sends you the money. Then for some reason you need to send it. She, she writes the check wrong or something and you need to send the. Yeah, it's too much. She yeah, so you have to send it back. And then between the time the, the check gets dishonored, so you end up sending her the money and you, your check is, you're, you don't get the money yourself. So it's, it, yeah, it's a scam where you get the. Uh, you get screwed and you certainly don't get a tenant. But this was this, I mean, all the red flags would go off. If you run enough ads, kind of like David's saying, you, and you see enough ads, you're going to start recognizing red flags. So uh, price is too low. They, they want to pressure you. They want to, they want you to pay cash the way you pay right now. Um, and in our case, it was uh, tenants who would say that they were, overseas and they wanted to pay cash and they they didn't want to scan other properties and you know your place was the only place for them and like, it just sounded kind of hokey now we do that said we did get a lot of people who were international or interprovincial or whatever who couldn't come in person and see the property and they did need to find something remotely like we had people who moved from norway people who came from the united states um, people who moved from all over the world indonesia uh, thailand and they needed to rent a place sight unseen. So, I mean, there are a number of things that you can do digitally. One is you can take a digital view of the of the place when you're going through it, or have that available on your on your um, site. Um, the other is sometimes they had somebody who lived in the city, and that person would take a tour with me, sort of by proxy. And so they could say, "Oh yeah, you know, Nelda's legit, and this is a legit property, and looks really nice, and it's clean, and yeah, let's you know go for it." Um, so there are a number of things that they could do. The tricky part was actually doing the diligence once they accept, accepted the place, because at that point you didn't necessarily have the ability to do credit checks because they're in another country. Uh, might have a hard time verifying references, again, country. Uh, so you had to sort of modify your, your vetting process a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if we want to get into those right now. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah, but it's very good to know that those those do exist. We actually do talk about them on, on my website, neldashulte.com. There are articles that walk you through what to ask for and how to ask for it and, and how to recognize if it's legit or not because there's a lot of scammers in the world. But if you give people enough hoops to jump through, you can eliminate quite a few of them. So. Yeah, oftentimes we notice that scammers really aren't looking for that. You know, they're not looking... The moment you show that you are competent, the moment you show that you're willing to question them, that's when they drop off yeah. because that's not what they're looking for. You know, like oftentimes, you know, people wonder, well, why, you know, why does a scam always look like a scam? The pictures look terrible. They're clearly stolen. The price doesn't look right. Well, that's why they're doing this on purpose because they're not looking to prey on someone who is capable of questioning things. They're looking to prey on someone who is going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're looking for someone who is going to accept whatever they say because that's an easy target. It's it's really sad to say, but you know that's one of the reasons that you have these, you know, these like senior scams. Because you know, the, you know, sometimes you call an older person, you claim to be their, you know, their uh, their grandchild, and it, it's believable because they want to believe it, you know. And it's really really sad, but that's the way it works. You know, they want it they want it to look believable or not believable, excuse me, 
because as long as they're able to filter out everybody that's going to catch on, the few people that are left over are likely to be easy targets. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Yes, good to know. So do you have any other uh, other suggestions for interprovincial or uh, other countries besides what we've gone through? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the basic one now, you know, ask, just like Nelda said, ask for, you know, like a video conference, take me through the apartment, show me the nooks and crannies. Uh, that one works really, really well. We also have uh, video conferencing built into quite a lot of, you know, platforms to allow for these virtual tours, uh, which works really well. Um, I'm a big believer in seeing properties myself, unfortunately. You know, I, I, I don't know if I'm a dinosaur or what, but when I move across, you know, like interprovincially, um, what I'll do is I will find multiple properties, set up like five or six tours in one day. I'll make the trip out. I'll spend two days you know, looking at apartments. I'll spend the day, you know, looking around the city just to get a feel of where I am. Um, and then from there, I'll actually make my decision because I want to know what I don't want to know what, you know, what it looks like myself. I might spot something that other people might not, you know, but if you're moving from, you know, if you're moving halfway around the world, that might not be possible. Um, you know, we typically say if you have friends, get them to do it for you. Alternatively, you really just have to, you know, have a little bit of faith in the landlord. Yeah, I used to have a lot of people who moved to my house in Fort Mac, um, and I advertised at one point through the HR department because I worked for a, a college there. And when people would get hired at HR and they just wanted a room for rent, and they'd say, well, you know, where do I go? What do I do? And they'd say, well, you know, here's an ad. We know her. She works for the college. And, and so that was kind of my endorsement. So, And I also knew that HR had screened them ahead of time. Not that I didn't do the screening. I still did a screening. But um, it was kind of a stronger recommendation for me that, they'd already been endorsed because they'd been hired by the college. And that was kind of a, re a referral for me as well. So yeah, there are other ways that you can sort of go about doing this. A couple of things we did, um, we would print out the ad that we'd created and we would take it to like a hospital or a school or a place that, you know, something close by that uh, we figured there'd be people, well-qualified people who, who might happen by the ad on a bulletin board or something. Um, I'm not sure if that's relevant to this, but it's it was a technique that we used. Yeah, David's in digital marketing, so that's probably not something he would recommend. <laughs> well, except we're using, we're using your, the actual ad that we created. But Yeah, uh, but um, to your point, of, you know, hit all avenues. You know, yeah. just, just do as much as you can. I think that's really good. Nowadays, what we do is uh, we put up a building next to a hospital, and then we target you know, the, uh, the nurses and doctors digitally instead of, you know, bringing in the paper. <laughs> How do you target the doctors and, and nurses digitally when it's a rental platform? Do you, do you say ideal for nurses and doctors? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's ideal for, you know, close commutes. That's what we say. Oh, close commutes. Because <laughs> you, can't, you can't use exclusive vocabulary within an ad. That's exactly it. Violation of the Human Rights Act. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good, you passed that one with flying colors, David. <laughs> a lot of landlords don't know that, and especially people who are uh, new to Canada and they might have a rental property, they want to rent a room or they want to rent their suite, and they'll say, you know, they want someone from their same ethnicity or from the same religion. You can't say that in Canada. You can actually be flying, be sued and lose a whole pile of money. They're the only uh, way in which you're able to um, specifically target someone of a specific, uh, you know, uh, ethnic or religious uh, set is if you yourself are actually running a religious organization. Uh, so there are multiple cases, specifically in the city of Toronto that I've actually worked on, uh, where you'll have these, um, you'll have uh, Catholic um, charities. So actually run by a Catholic, by a local Catholic church, where they'll have units that are subsidized, uh, typically in law, on the same land as a uh, Catholic church. Um, and then they can actually specifically target and only rent out to, you know, to other people of the same, um, <clears throat> of the same, you know, religious, um orientation excuse me um I otherwise you're not allowed to do that it's you know it's it's you know everybody's equal you when you're renting an apartment you have to treat everybody equally the only you know way that you're allowed to differentiate them is based on their you know whether they have a job and whether they have a good credit history good to hear yeah or start a cult <laughs> <laughs> rent on the same property that you or the same area that you live in or that you have your cult living in and you're good to go <laughs> that was something i didn't know about that's good to know david thanks for that that is interesting yes i didn't know that either 
Okay, so uh, do we have any other tips for uh, landlords to get their properties in those besides what we've covered? Ooh, I uh, I think I've been I've pretty much gone through everything that I had prepared. Uh, only other uh, only other thing I you know I would recommend is I know we talked about this right at the beginning. You know, obviously you want to put your ads you know online digitally. Um, if uh, if someone is ever concerned about a property potentially being a scam or they're not quite sure. You know, what I always tell them, search the property online. If you're not sure if the person you're dealing with owns the property or is actually a representative, search them online, see if they exist. If it is a professionally managed property, they will have some online presence. Make sure you have a website. This is huge. I know a lot of smaller property managers and landlords just don't. A website's not expensive and it will give you so much more credibility. Um, and then the other one is, you know, I know rent board and, you know, rent faster specifically, these are paid listings and you know what you're paying for a reason because it's a right. quality platform. But if you can put, put your listings in multiple platforms, because it, again, it's good for exposure. It's good for visibility. And if you're looking for someone clear across the country, you know, uh, just because rent board might be big in your community, rentals.ca might be bigger in, you know, the community that this person is coming from. And you want to make sure you're targeting the biggest, you know, the biggest, broadest, majority of people that are actually looking for apartments, regardless of where they are. Is there an easy way to know, uh, like, for example, what would be popular in Newfoundland versus what would be possible in D.C. or Toronto? Um, <laughs> no, it really, really, it really isn't. Um, I, I can share, you know, um, Rent Faster, Rent Board, very big in uh, in Alberta. Um, rent Board is also growing straight clear across the prairies. You know, very, you know, really strong, uh, you know, grasp there. Red Board is also really big amongst secondary markets. So really, really important if you're in a smaller growing community, Red Board is the place to go. Uh, Rentals.ca is big in all across Ontario, clear across Ontario, and it's also growing quite a lot out in British Columbia. Um, and it also has a very strong presence in pretty much every ur major urban market, Calgary, Winnipeg, Edmonton, um, and the uh, the Atlantic provinces. Um, and then uh, Rent Canada, very similar to Red Board. Uh, very strong in the prairies and uh, in you know smaller growing communities, and then we also have Lou Way uh, in uh, in Quebec. Not super relevant here. <laughs> That's fair, and those those uh, those um, patterns will change over time anyway, because one goes up, one goes down. So what you're saying today may not be true a year from now. Um, That's why we say just put your listings on as many platforms as possible, because it makes, brings up your exposure and makes sure that you're you know you're searchable. Fair yeah, and it's just like you said, it just takes that one person to rent your property and then you pay for everything, right? So that's correct. Yeah. All good. Well, that is fantastic. So that was an excellent summary. Thank you very much for that, David. And you gave a lot of really good tips, a lot of information that I hadn't had never heard of before. And I guess it really helps. I guess it does really help to have the data analytics because you're looking at, at hard cold data every day. And so you can see the trends and you can see the types of things that maybe I wouldn't see as a private landlord, you know, looking at properties, running ads. I'm not getting the overview from the high level that you are. Um, is there any other data that you want to share with us? It's something we should be looking at or it's something you're looking into that you might be sharing with us later on? Um, well, I mean, um, I, I myself work for uh, an, organization, uh, excuse me, an organization called RentSync. Uh, we own and manage, uh, you know, we, we are the largest multifamily marketing you know, firm in Canada. We own and manage rent board, rent faster, uh, amongst several other, you know, uh, brands. Um, you know, what I can say oh, is, rent, you know, sync. rent, rent, sync. rent, sync, rent sync, correct. Yes. Y -N -C. Okay. I'll put that yeah. at the end. R-E-N-T-S-Y-N-C. So we deal directly with landlords. If you own multiple, you know, multifamily properties, uh, we allow you to very quickly syndicate your listings out to multiple platforms. Uh, we also have a very, um, we, we have a, a big uh, blog where I myself write, uh, articles, uh, you know, Occasionally, typically once a month, uh, we have a demand report which talks about lead volume each and every single month across Canada. Uh, and we take a lot of the insights that we learn and we make them public. So if you're interested to learn more, go to rentsync.com and uh, check out the blog section. Cool. So rentsync.com. R-E-N-T-S-Y-N-C. Here, let me. Uh, and um, yeah, it would be great to have it up on the board. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> is that a t-shirt, David? That is, in fact, it's my t-shirt. Are, are you wearing it? That t-shirt also? No, I'm, I'm wearing a, a, a polo. <laughs> what a trader. What a trader. <laughs> Can I ask where, where Rent Sync is, like uh, what the, where their office is? Yeah, uh, our head office is in St. Catharines, Ontario, and uh, we have a satellite office in uh, Toronto. So I always thought that Rent Board was owned by someone in Calgary. It was. Uh, it was. 
uh, they came over, they were part of our team, and uh, we now manage the, pro the website. Okay. So yeah. now so you're, you're a rent board and rent faster. Correct. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I always loved, uh, I don't know what Rent Board has for analytics, but Rent Faster had great analytics. Really did. Yeah, we, we still have the site. Every single city has, you know, the achievable rents currently, achievable rents last year. Uh, and it'll give you some of the, you know, deep and, you know, nitty gritty that you otherwise can't really get. You know, even rentals.ca, we released monthly rent report, uh, mm -hmm. but that's just aggregated data. You know, that's data that I've analyzed that we put together, whereas Rent Faster just gives everything to you. Yeah, I, they had days on market. They had like all sorts of really fantastic information. We would, uh, yeah, I, I, it's a fantastic site. Um, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. Um, other question, my last question, I guess, would be: Can do you have data analytics for um, how the different, like when when you look at, at, I have to back up when you look at Canadian analytics for the rental housing market. Typically, you only see the rental housing market analytics for apartment buildings. Can you do the rental analytics or do you have a, an aggregate report for the analytics for condos, houses, townhouses, single families, that sort of yeah. thing? The reason you get analytics mostly for apartment buildings is that's done through CMHC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but with, uh, with RentBoard and RentFaster, they're, they're using the, the data that they're getting. Yeah, so um, the rentals.ca report, um, the, sorry, the rentals.ca rent report, which comes out every single month, typically uh, around the 10th to the 11th. Uh, you know, if you were ever, you know, out and about and you hear, you know, the market re average rent for this city is, you know, X dollars or, you know, year over year rents increased by this much, this many percent, nine times out of 10. In fact, you know what, 10 times out of 10, they're referring to the rentals.ca rent report. Uh, that data is, that data comes from RentFaster and rentals.ca. Uh, in that report, we look at current market rents each and every single month. Um, we basically we break it down by total property. So that is, you know, um, that is single family, townhouses, duplex, triplex, apartment, condo. And then we also break it out apartment and condo only. Uh, we don't really do too much with just single family and townhouse. However, um, if that's something that someone is interested in, we do also offer reports for sale. So if you're looking just to get, you know, just some data out there, uh, they can always reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to share my email with you, or if you if you want, you can share my email. Um, and you know, we make data available on an on an ad need basis. Well, that's great because I well, we had interviewed Rent Panda the week before, two weeks before, and they had gotten data showing that it used to be the formula for renting a property was a, was one third of a tenant's rent, but they discovered now that it's between 46 and a little bit over 50 percent of most people's household income is going to work rent. Is that information you can offer as well? Or? Um, we don't typically do that, but that is something that we can do. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a data analyst. If you give me a, you know, give me a challenge and I'll, I'll try to solve it for you. <laughs> you know, a man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, uh, you know, we like to say we have uh, the largest database of purposeful rental data and, you know, just of current market rents in Canada. Uh, so if, you know, that's something someone is interested in, yeah, uh, we have noticed that rents are substantially higher when it, as, uh, in regards to um, percentage of achievable income. Um, that said, though, you know, we're, you know, I'm speaking to a group of landlords here. Nobody's going to crucify me for this. But um, with the increase in um, achievable rents in the last, you know, 10 years, specifically, certainly in larger urban centers, um, a higher relative proportion of, of income being paid to rent isn't necessarily that difficult. You know, if you're low income, yes, that is a problem. That is a challenge. But when we're talking about 50% of income, you know, of someone's income potentially uh, going to rent, we're not typically talking about someone very low income. We're talking about, you know, a young urban professional living in the city. Um, you know, that is, that they typically, you know, they'll achieve a stronger income, but they're also paying a larger proportion of that, you know, towards rent because they want the privilege of living in a nice urban environment. Right. Yeah. And then are you seeing more people, I don't know if this is something you analyzed, are you seeing more people in that income bracket with roommates or kind of mixed families, you know, maybe I live with a brother or sister and then a couple of roommates or whatever to split the rent? Is that something you can That analyze? is something that we're seeing. Yeah, that is something that we're seeing more of. There, We saw a pretty substantial increase in the proportion of, um, of renters that are now living with roommates. Uh, the proportion of renters um, under the age of 25 in, with rent with a roommate is now higher than ever before. Um, on top of that, we're also seeing, and this is a little more relevant to your previous question, 
Um, the fastest growing income segment amongst renters is households with $120,000 or more. What that means is that we're seeing more and more renters with really high incomes coming into the rental market. And that's also, you know, skewing the rents because, you know, a lot of these, you know, these households, they're not looking at, you know, downscale, you know, duplex apartments. They're looking at really upscale luxury rental accommodations. And, you know, they charge a pretty penny and that'll, you know, represent a pretty substantial portion of their income potentially. So these are not people who want to buy a house. They're people who make a good income, they're established in their careers, and they want to rent. Whether they want to rent or they're relegated to the rental market, that's what we're seeing quite a lot of right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's really good information to have. Uh, it's very interesting. Oh, very informative. I've learned a lot, too. Yeah, it's <laughs> really excellent. David, you are a wealth of data information. <laughs> I'm going to help. Yes, so I will post all of your information on the YouTube video on the backlinks. So for those of you who are watching this, you're saying, how can I get hold of David? How can I get hold of Rent Sync? How can I get my hands on some of those data analytics? I will post all of that on the bottom of the YouTube video. So you will have everything. You will know everything that I know. So David, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was really great to hear all of your information and for you to share all of this wealth of um, knowledge with us. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, it was a pleasure speaking with you. And Gil, thank you for um, grilling David. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. <laughs> thanks for the questions and thanks for the information. It's Renting is always an interesting, interesting place to be. You're never dealing with the same thing ever more than once. It's always different with every single person. Anyway, with that said, I'm Nelda Schulte. This is Alberta Landlord's Watch. If you really liked this YouTube video, like it, share it. You can also find me on Instagram, Schulte Nelda. You can find me, you can join my Facebook group, which is called Alberta Landlord's Watch, or my Facebook page, Alberta Landlord's Watch. And I'm also on LinkedIn, Nelda Schulte. So I look forward to supporting you in your landlording journey and offering you more of these wonderful guests who share their wealth of information with you to support you with your landlording journey. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.